All right, last part of the shoulder chapter, we are going to bring it all together and talk about functional considerations. <clears throat> so, the movement of the entire shoulder is a result of movement in each of its four joints. So all of those four joints, the sternoclavicular joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the scapulothoracic joint, and the glenohumeral joint, have to interact properly for normal shoulder motion to occur. So this, um, the scapulohumeral rhythm is a good example, and we'll um, describe that again. Um, I think I told you in one of the earlier lectures, I always forget which stories I tell and which I don't. Um, of someone who had a uh, sternoclavicular joint infection and had to have it surgically debrided twice. And um, it seriously affected their glenohumeral motion. And so after the um, surgical debridement and the recovery from the infection, we worked a lot in therapy on getting his glenohumeral motion back. I've also worked with several people who had cl um, clavicle fractures and um, AC joint separations that severely um, impaired their glenohumeral motion. Also, if um, glenohumeral motion is impaired, you all often get faulty scapulothoracic mechanics. So we're not working on any of these joints in isolation. We have to work on all of them. So the scapulohumeral rhythm, during normal shoulder abduction or flexion, there is a natural 2 to 1 ratio between the glenohumeral and scapulothoracic joint. So, here's the part I want you to remember. For every two degrees of glenohumeral abduction, the scapula must simultaneously upwardly rotate roughly one degree. So, you get 120 degrees of glenohumeral abduction plus 60 degrees of scapular thoracic upward rotation, which adds up to 180 degrees of shoulder abduction. So, it's a, a 2 to 1 ratio. 2 degrees of glenohumeral motion for every 1 degree of scapular upward rotation. Isn't that neat how that works? And, just for fun, as the scapula is upwardly rotating, it's restoring contractility to the middle deltoid, allowing us to have the muscular action for that um, abduction. Pretty cool, right? So, the shoulder complex, we talked about innervation with the individual muscles, but um, just innervation for the whole shoulder complex, the brachial plexus, um, besides those few little different ones like the upper trapezius that we talked about, the entire upper extremity is innervated by the brachial plexus. The majority of the shoulder complex muscles are innervated from two brachial plexus regions. Um, the nerves that branch from the posterior cord, and we'll look at a picture of the brachial plexus next. But nerves that branch from the posterior cord and nerves branching from the more proximal segments of the plexus. So like the dorsal scapular nerve and the superior scapular nerve, those branch from the more proximal segments of the plexus. A lot of times those are called early exiting nerves, meaning they exit the brachial plexus before they form the, um, the uh, peripheral nerves that go all the way out to the end of the arm. <clears throat> the exception, of course, we talked about is the trapezius muscle, which is um, innervated by cranial nerve 11. So that's the only one that doesn't um, come off the brachial plexus. The dorsal scapular and superior scapular and all those are early exiting nerves from the brachial plexus. So here is the brachial plexus. And the... So... On the right side of this picture, we have the spinal nerve roots, um, C5 through T1, basically. And, and then the roots um, join together and form the trunks. Um, so the trunks are upper, middle, and lower. And there, so there are some, you can see some of the early exiting nerves. So the dorsal scapular nerve um, exit in the root section. Um, the suprascapular nerve um, exits when it divides into trunks. Um, after it divides into trunks, then it goes into um, subdivisions, um, anterior and posterior, and the anterior and posterior are mostly 
its relation to the brachial artery. Um, then it divides into cords, and um, then it goes out to the peripheral nerves. And so the cords are lateral, posterior, and medial, um, and then the nerves are musculocutaneous, axillary, radial, median, and ulnar. Um, and I think of the um, peripheral nerves as marmu, um, so it's mus uh, musculocutaneous, axillary, radial, median, and ulnar, marmu. You want to think of it that way. So when we talk about the muscles lower down in the arm, they all get one of those five peripheral nerves. So um, I think that's all I'm going to say about the brachial plexus. There are some mnemonics for um, remembering the brachial plexus. It's usually roots, trunks, divisions, cords. Um, I'm not really going to quiz you on that, but it's nice little information to know for um, when we start getting into upper extremity orthopedics. Um, so this is kind of just your introduction to that. How's that for skimming over something? <laughs> okay. So I talked a little bit about how the um, good scapular thoracic alignment is having it slightly elevated um, because we want the glenoid fossa to be oriented um, in an upward direction. So if you have weakness of the upper trapezius or paralysis of the upper tra trapezius over time, it's going to lead to a depressed or downwardly rotated scapula. So in this picture, that little wire that's going down to the uh, top of glenoid fossa, top of the scapula, is, is meant to represent the upper trapezius. So in picture A, this is how it's supposed to be. Um, the line of pull, um, the resultant vector from the... Um, the uh, different lines of pull pulls the head of the humerus into the glenoid fossa. Um, when the glenoid fossa turns downward and it's depressed, you get a, um, a less strong line of pull. Um, you change the vectors. So um, a chronically depressed clavicle can eventually lead to superior dislocation of the sternoclavicular joint. Um, and a weakness of the upper trapezius can lead to subluxation of the glenohumeral joint. You'll see this a lot in people who have had strokes and that's affected. You'll see people with subluxed um, shoulder joints and a lot of times they have to wear a um, device to help support their shoulder because they lack the innervation to the muscles um, to keep the shoulder, um, keep the head of the humerus against the glenoid fossa. So um, it's pretty important um, structural stability, and you see it commonly in the clinic where people have that sublux glenohumeral joint, and that can cause pain and movement problems. So <clears throat> people after CVA already have a lot of problems, and this is just another one of them. So I briefly mentioned when we were talking about the latissimus dorsi how the latissimus dorsi has a reverse uh, reversal of muscle function for crutch walking. So the reversal of the shoulder depressors can be really useful clinically because um, thorax elevation or trunk elevation is useful for a lot of activities. So crutch walking, ambulation with a walker. In this picture, it's showing someone using their upper extremities to unweight their ischial tuberosities for pressure relief. So when we're talking about the hip, I was saying how if someone who, who has difficulty moving can get pressure sores on their ischial tuberosities because it's bony landmarks pushing into the tissues around it. Um, so you can use those scapular depressors to lift the trunk. So by putting the, um, by fixing the upper extremities, so basically putting the arms in closed chain, um, you can do that with crutches, so the crutch becomes an extension of your arm and turns it into a closed chain motion with the floor. Or in this picture, the person sort of using their elbow 
to, to do it, but basically you're putting the upper extremity into closed chain and you're doing a reversal of muscle function. So rather than depressing the shoulders, you're elevating the trunk. So elevating the trunk to move the torso through the crutches or ambulate with the walker or elevating the trunk to um, take pressure off the lower extremities. So this is a really important functional motion for um, rehabilitation. And so these muscles can be really useful um, sources of muscular substitution for people with weakened, injured, or paralyzed lower extremities. So the shoulder depressors can be really important. So someone who has a spinal cord injury where they still have innervation of the upper extremities has a lot better mobility um, than someone who doesn't have that innervation. So a lot of those shoulder depressors, you can see they're innervated by um, early exiting muscles from the brachial plexus. So <clears throat> the lower your spinal cord injury, even if you have a cervical injury, the lower it is, the more functionality you're going to have in your upper extremities and the better chance you have of um, having good mobility. So the scapular winging refers to the medial border of the scapula lifting away from the rib cage and it's a sign of serratus anterior weakness. So um, a lot of times um, in this, this is just like extreme scapular winging in the picture here. So the serratus anterior can't, um, isn't strong enough to pull the medial board of the scapula down onto the rib cage and um, protract it. So a lot of times what we do is the um, push-up plus or the serratus anterior push-up where you do that extra motion and the top motion of a push-up to protract the scapula. It exaggerates that final phase of the push-up um, and engages the serratus anterior to do additional protraction of the scapula at the end phase. A lot of times you have to do this on the wall to begin with because people are not strong enough to do it from the floor. <clears throat> but we can look in the, in the lab and see who in the class has a winged scapulae and who needs to do uh, push-ups with a plus. I worked with a guy one time who had had um, surgery for neck cancer and they nicked his long thoracic nerve and so he, his uh, serratus anterior didn't work and he had serious scapular winging. So because the nerve was damaged, um, we couldn't strengthen the serratus anterior so we had to work some of the other muscles to, um, even though the serratus anterior is the major protractor and prevents winging, you could work on other scapular stabilizers to stabilize the scapula as much as possible. It was never going to be normal, but um, we could stabilize his shoulder as much as possible. So that long thoracic nerve innervates the um, serratus anterior, and if that is uh, compromised, you're going to get scapular winging. It also, uh, scapular winging also prevents smooth movement of the scapula on the um, rib cage, and so that's its functional importance. So, the shoulder adductors um, and downward rotators can work together to help control scapular motion. So, um, resisted shoulder adduction, like a pull-up, um, or a row um, requires the, the interaction between the glenohumeral adductors and the scapular downward rotators in order to stabilize the scapula to get a good rowing motion. So a lot of times, I mean, those of you that are personal trainers or Pilates instructors um, might tell your clients to retract their scapulae as they pull back, as they row. Um, and so that is helping you engage those scapular retractors and downward rotators to give you a stronger um, um, adduction and extension and um, control your scapular motion. Kind of cool. Um, so scapular humeral rhythm has sort of um, threaded through this entire chapter. Um, the upward rotation of the scapula is an essential component of abduction or flexion of the shoulder. So how many times a day do you lift your arm up? A million, right? So if you don't have that scapular upward rotation, you can get impingement and you're going to have less range of motion. So the um, scapulohumeral rhythm 
um, adds to your total range of motion for the shoulder. And the upward scapular rotation also helps maintain the favorable length tension relationship of the muscles through the range of motion. So um, it's, the, it's really a good example of the cooperation of muscles to um, perform those functional tasks. And these are functions that we do all the time. Lifting our arm up, um, pulling on things, pulling back on things. So having that good um, muscular cooperation makes a big difference. So I said um, way back in the muscle chapter um, that even though they show the muscles in isolation in the book, none of them work in isolation. They all cooperate to improve the function of our movements. The rotator cuff muscles are another group that cooperate to improve functional movements. It's the sits muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. They actively stabilize the head of the humerus on the glenoid fossa. So they surround the humeral head anteriorly, superiorly, and posteriorly, and each of them contributes to a muscular force that pulls the head of the humerus in and down toward the glenoid fossa. Um, they function also as dynamic stabilizers of glenohumeral motion, um, giving stability to the loose fitting joint during motion. So um, they can dynamically adjust to make sure that the head of the humerus is in the glenoid fossa. So during glenohumeral motion, the rotator cuff controls the active arthrokinematics of the abducting glenohumeral joint. So when we're abducting, we have roll and slide in opposite directions because we have <clears throat> the convex head of the humerus moving on the concave gleno, um, glenoid fossa. So the supraspinatus directs compression force into the glenoid fossa that stabilizes the humeral head um, against the fossa during the superior roll. The other three muscles provide the inferiorly directed force to counteract the tendency of the deltoids to pull the humerus superiorly. So we again, we keep the humerus from crashing into the acromion process by counteracting that upward pull of the deltoids. So there are, um, between the um, scapulothoracic, um, oh, this, I'm sorry, this is the prime movers and force couples of shoulder girdle motion. <clears throat> so the prime movers of scapular elevation um, are the upper trapezius, the levator scapula, and the rhomboids. Um, the prime movers for depression are the lower trapezius and the pec minor, um, with help from the latissimus dorsi by pulling down on the humerus. Um, the protraction, the prime mover for protraction is the serratus anterior. The prime mover for retraction, um, the middle trapezius and the rhomboids. Um, the force couple for upward rotation are the upper trapezius, lower trapezius, and serratus anterior. The force couple for downward rotation are the levator scapulae, rhomboids, and pec minor. So um, that's a good little set of information to uh, memorize if you're into memorizing things. <clears throat> but knowing the prime movers and the force couples of the different actions are going to tell you when you need to strengthen a certain thing or when, um, or when something's not working well. So um, that's a good thing. Knowing the prime movers also tells you what the antagonists are. Um, so it's a, it's a nice um, little relationship. The second relationship that I wanted to highlight are complementary shoulder motions. So <clears throat> with every glenohumeral movement, which those are our major um, functional movements, um, we, also, we have a scapulothoracic movement that goes with it. So um, we also have acromioclavicular and sternoclavicular movements that go with, with all those movements. <clears throat> and if you want to, you can expand this chart to include two more columns and put in the um, AC and SC movements that go with the glenohumeral movement. But we're just going to talk about the um, scapula, thoracic, and glenohumeral right here. So for abduction or flexion, also known as... Um, humeral elevation, um, 
the scapulothoracic, um, you get elevation and upward rotation. Um, for adduction or extension, you get depression and downward rotation. For horizontal adduction, you need scapular protraction. For horizontal abduction, you need scapular retraction. So there's, there's a motion that goes with every one of these. So if you want to, you can think about functional motions and um, of the uh, humerus and what are the scapular thoracic motions that go with them. So if I were going to put a, a box up on a shelf, my scapula would need to upwardly rotate and elevate. If I wanted to bring a box down from a shelf, it would have to downwardly rotate and depress. <clears throat> if I was going to hug a tree, my, my scapula thoracic joint would need to protract. Um, if I was going to um, do jumping jacks, my scapula thoracic joint would have to be a little bit retracted because I'm in horizontal abduction. Um, so you can think about different functional movements and what happens at the different joints. And if you really want to get crazy, add in that acromioclavicular and sternoclavicular joint. So in summary, the shoulder complex is very complicated. It's one of the most complex musculoskeletal systems in the body, but it does a lot of things, right? Very functional for us. Proper shoulder motion requires coordinated action of lots of muscles across multiple joints. And shoulder dysfunction is so common. It is one of the most common reasons people come into physical therapy. Um, it's the most, one of the most common reasons that people have trouble doing activities of daily living. Um, some factors making shoulder dysfunction likely also make the shoulder complex highly adaptable. So the fact that it is highly mobile makes it adaptable, but it also makes it prone to dysfunction. Um, the fact that you have so many different muscles doing things makes it really adaptable, but if one muscle's not doing its job, it affects the whole group. So um, there are pluses and minuses, but overall I think the shoulder is a pretty awesome joint.